And now for today's presentation, consumer medical device design requirements. Discussing today's topic is Mark Waring, Strategic Account Manager at Hiroshi, providing marketing support for Hiroshi's RF, 5G, and consumer electronic solutions. Mark is a graduate of San Diego State University with a Bachelor of Science in Physics and an MBA from Pepperdine University. Mark has held various technology and business roles in Silicon Valley for the past 20 years. It's with great pleasure I now turn this special session over to Mark. Mark, take it away. Okay, thanks, Bill. Thanks to everybody for taking your time to join today. Uh, we just wanted to briefly share our latest perspective as a connector supplier on the many consumer medical device efforts that we're supporting various customers on and give you a little insight into a few of the most current features and spec requirements that are driving successful designs. So let's get started and uh, heads up. I don't think we put that in our invite, but this was going to be a brief to the point uh, overview. It's going to take a little over 30 minutes and then time for Q and A's at the end, as Bill mentioned. Uh, the medical industry is evolving quickly. Technology is absolutely driving a lot of new paths to deliver value to end users. Consumer facing solutions are becoming much more important both for the virtual or remote health experience and for two-way access to information, both from devices and devices as health data portals. Hardware plays a central role in both arenas and investments reflect a commitment by major health industry leaders, as do an accelerating number of new medical devices entering the FDA's pipeline for potential release to professionals and to consumers. So the arrow is definitely up and to the right, and it, you can really get excited if you, you know, spend a little time browsing articles and information on what's really coming out. They're sort of popping up left and right. So there's no question that the uh, consumer-driven types of medical devices are a really quickly growing part of the industry. Uh, and medical or fitness wearables is already one big success story. It's almost taken for granted now, I think. Uh, growing customer preference for wearable devices is a prominent trend in spite of some security concerns related to data privacy, with over one in five of the adult population in this country owning a fitness tracker within 2020. Today, consumer medical wearables represent a continued large growth opportunity with many new wearable devices catering to more specific demographics with optimized features. Consumer medical device introductions help address global factors even, which are driving the challenges of providing medical care, including the ongoing prevalence and in some cases increases in disease. Aging populations with several specific categories of associated device needs, healthcare industries around the world focusing on early diagnosis and prevention, and a shift boosted of course by COVID toward remote or self-care and remote or self-monitoring capabilities. Consumer medical devices are far from a monolithic market, but they're very much stratified with an easy to see range, evolving from what was and still is traditionally in office or in hospital monitoring and diagnostic capability equipment to portable lower cost equipment that can be co-managed between patients and healthcare providers, to even smaller individually managed devices, including not only the successful wrist-worn devices, but new emerging categories today, whether earbud health devices, which are coming, arm and leg medical sleeves, and even smaller ring form factor connected devices, specifically for medical diagnosis and monitoring. Considering how these new consumer medical devices fall into categories in a little more detail, we can see distinct value paths emerging from professionally managed equipment, which is migrating out of the hospital or doctor's office to the patient's home. These devices are often linked to a care provider's network or data collection and analysis system. These are often still FDA regulated with long development and approval cycles, but with significant cost savings opportunities. 
Remote patient monitoring is an extension of the same idea, but equipment that may be prescribed or recommended by health providers or insurance partners and used independently from a regimented care provider supervision, taking what may have been in-office or in-hospital capabilities to the patient's own home. And I wanted to mention that you, know, that you can even separate these categories further, remote testing versus remote monitoring. And it could even add a third, remote treatment are two distinct subsegments, if you will, of remote patient care opportunities. These products deliver efficiency, cost, and convenience factors that open up, open up a much broader range of usage and revenue models. And as already mentioned, a growing family of true consumer devices, which include dedicated monitoring devices, wrist-worn or otherwise, as well as increasing medical functions included on general purpose smart wearable devices. For these, cost-benefit features and online capabilities are what it's all about. And also worth mentioning, these devices are adding capabilities year on year, which will allow them inevitably to climb further up the value chain and capture an even larger portion of the medical device market. I think we say that the iPhones or your smartphone is the equivalent of a supercomputer 10 years ago. Maybe your smart medical device that you can have at home is going to be the equivalent of an ICU room, you know, before long. So with the market in question clarified just a little bit, let's pause to quickly introduce some categories of the types of connector solutions we'll be talking about. One very well widely used category is board to boards or B2B as it's sometimes called. Uh, it's used to describe not only a true board to board interface, but today in consumer electronics and consumer uh, medical devices, it's more likely going to be used with one half soldered to the PCB substrate and the other half soldered to a flexible FPC or flexible printed circuit to get you to some other component or other part of your board. Another category are ZIFs or zero insertion force connectors, which typically include a mechanical actuator or lever to compress and hold the mated cable in place or as I'll introduce later, some very new solutions which automatically close and lock. Board to wires are another widely used solution in consumer electronics, spanning from very small micro solutions to much larger scales, including pre-joined ribbon cable styles and ganged individually shielded micro coax options. And one more often included family are individual surface mount micro coax receptacles, primarily for RF antenna routing or internal radio signaling. For our first of two case studies, let's look at the smaller end of the spectrum using the largest and fastest growing category of wrist wearable devices. Although these issues discussed certainly can apply to other form factors and even other classes of devices. The issues we'll cover quickly include XY area limitations, vertical space constraints, some reasons why variable height solutions are becoming more important, and high frequency digital or RF signal management. And finally, how connectors themselves can directly uh, affect the assembly and yields of the end product. So wearables of any kind and medical or fitness devices, no exception, clearly push the limits of integrating a lot of electronics into a very small area. Think earbuds is an even smaller example, which yes, most often include micro connectors inside. So if we consider a fitness wearable as our example, uh, the XY space is a premium, and this pushes cables and connectors to deliver narrower signal paths and drives the need for finer pitches, as well as the need for the overall outer footprint to be shrunk at the same time. These requirements are compounded when, as we see today, these even small devices such as this are starting to include more and more paths and circuit traces inside that need connectivity. 
Perose leads in XY form factor solutions with a progression of ever smaller state-of-the-art form factors with pitches of only 0.35 millimeters now offered across several families and with corresponding overall widths of under three millimeters. And to clarify, when I say width, I'm talking about the maximum outer dimension of a mated pair of connectors to more recently less than two millimeters to even smaller 1.7 and what we claim to be the narrowest mainstream solution today at 1.5 millimeters total width. It's the thickness of a penny. And coming later this year is our next generation solution with a further 20% reduction in width and a next generation pitch of 0.3 millimeters. So these are little connectors that you can almost lose in the palm of your hand, but there's what they are what is needed for really enabling a lot of the small form factor consumer electronics and consumer medical devices that you're seeing in the market today. Vertical is the next maybe most obvious, you know, constraint that has to be met in some of these devices. The height of mated pairs can also be a critical metric. The overall thickness is already severely limited by design, by the nature of the product themselves. And within this, limit. There are often multiple stack subsystems, including displays, touch panels, mod other modules, and circuit boards. And within these layers, there's often multiple signaling paths and multiple path types, which often requ require multiple connections and cabling integration. So a lot going on inside these small products, actually. So as in width, with micro connectors, we're talking submillimeter dimensions with a recent progression, in our case, from 0.8 millimeter total stack height solutions. And again, just like in width, I'm talking about a total mated pair stack height to 0.7 millimeters down to 0.6. And recently, the again, what we claim to be the industry's leading uh, stack height option down to half a millimeter in total stack height. In addition to the soldered PCB or board to board type connectors that I've been showing here, uh, flexible printed circuit solutions, even the smallest of uh, medical device designs are making use of, such as zips or zero insertion force connectors. And earlier this year, we introduced the industry's lowest height zip solution, the FH64, coming in again at only 0 0.5 total height. This solution is already showing up in some consumer wearables. This industry leader offers wide guidance structures to aid consistent insertion and metal spring loaded tongues, which hold that FPC cable in place with a high retention force. Also, staggered contact rows, importantly inside the connector, allow for an FPC pitch of, for example, 0.3 millimeters to support the end narrower pitch of 0.25 millimeters. This relaxed FPC tolerance translates directly to maintaining low manufacturing costs, even with the state-of-the-art contact pitch achieved. So by staggering those leads, we're giving a little broader tolerances to the FPC manufacturers to keep their costs down at the same time. Next, let's talk about variability in stack heights and why it's also becoming more important to designers. In recent generations of small form factor products, we've seen a growing recognition of the need not only for the lowest absolute stack height possible, but for the availability of a variation in stack heights for similar connector solutions. The benefit of variable height is easily demonstrated by considering one of the multiple signaling path scenarios I mentioned on the previous slides. If two such paths are populated on a circuit board layer with overlapping cabling, stresses on one or the other are unavoidable, and the integrity of either the cable itself, the connection, or both may be seriously compromised. With the option of variable stack height connectors, it's just as easy to see that margins for crossing signal paths may be met, removing the vertical path interference and its negative effects on product design. A real world result in this case may not be a perfect vertical alignment, but now perhaps some extra space between the two, which in this case is easily complemented with passive padding, maintaining again an ideal vertical alignment. 
And in other cases, it's not cross ceiling paths themselves that's driving this need, but other adjacent board mounted component heights, which may require some variability in connector height, again, to optimize the vertical alignments. At Hirose, we've focused on adding recently on adding key stack height options to some of our mainstream series, with now two popular families available in both 0.8 millimeters and our industry leading 0.6 millimeter stack height options. This year, we have more series coming with multiple stack height options, increasing support for this growing design requirement. Let's move on and discuss high frequency RF or high frequency digital signals and how to manage their efforts, these effects in small devices through optimized connector solutions. Hirose was an early pioneer in designing and introducing the first mass-produced shielded microconnectors, specifically for RF signals, with our introduction way back in 1990 of the now de facto industry standard form factor, the Hirose U.FL series. The U.FL includes both shielded micro-coax cables together with a tightly coupled connector plug and PCB-mounted receptacle combination to achieve RF signal performance from 4 to 8 gigahertz. This family continues to evolve today with smaller form factors and higher frequency support from eight to 12 gigahertz. And more recently, we've gone back and redesigned a new intermatable U.FL plug cable assembly with much more aggressive shielding, bringing the signaling performance capability all the way up to 15 gigahertz. And even more recently, this past summer, we launched a new shielded microcoax solution in a yet smaller form factor, which carries this family into the 5G millimeter wave domain with the introduction of the shielded C.FL supporting frequencies up to 30 gigahertz. But for small medical devices, board-to-board -board or board-to-FPC solutions are the preferred choice. You get a lot of signals together in a very small package. We started to look seriously at this about three years ago and introduced our first product addressing this specifically in the BM46, which has high-frequency analog RF-optimized contacts to address RF signaling quality and internal signal-to-signal -signal crosstalk mitigation all in a standard micro board to board package. The BM46 contacts include optimized impedance matching and deliver superior signal integrity with minimized reflections. In addition is a unique integrated center metal shield embedded in the plastic itself, which reduces crosstalk effects when high frequency signals are routed on top and bottom rows. So any one of these contacts are optimized for RF. We see customers who choose to put the RF signals on opposite ends of the same row or customers who choose to put RF signals across the two rows as indicated here to take advantage of that center shield. But this is very much a growing trend in the general industry and certainly in medical devices as well. And so there's even more interesting solutions that uh, we've introduced. Uh, this, same, this year, 2022, we released the next generation, the BM56G, shown there on the right. It's a very different animal altogether with something integrated again into the plastic itself that looks something closer to a full sh metal shield box that, if you recall, those put on top of components on PC boards. This is included on both halves of the mated pair. So when mated, the pair achieves support for multiple RF signal paths with excellent signal integrity performance up to 12 gigahertz. And all this added structure is delivered with a total mated height, again, of only 0.6 millimeters and a width of only 2.2 millimeters unmatched for any hybrid shielded structure in the market today. The shielding that I mentioned mitigates radiated emissions, effectively blocking internally generated noise from interfering with other components or other radio systems even inside the product, and similarly protecting the signals inside from external interference. Today, we're preparing a third generation solution targeted for release this fall 
coming up pretty soon. Adding even more aggressive shielding and pushing SI performance well into the true 5G millimeter range at over 30 gigahertz. I mentioned that connectors not only have a direct effect on things like form factor and electrical performance, but they can also affect how the product is assembled. Connectors are often the only mechanically active part in that product design, and they can therefore directly affect the design and assembly aspects of successful solutions. High volume manual or automated assembly lines are often paired during the final assembly processes. Misconnects, breakage concerns can affect product rework, yields, and costs. And the actual assembly process of putting the connectors together can also affect assembly cycle times, which again directly impact costs. Hiroshi is led again in bringing what we call fully armored construction to our manufacturing process. Many micro board to board solutions leave plastic exposed in multiple locations with the chance of these sub millimeter thick structures chipping or even breaking during assembly. Partial armoring may protect some of these surfaces, but leave others exposed, such as in this example, the center plastic island. Our leadership in full armor design results in full metal on metal mating surfaces delivering superior mating protection with a repeatable high yield design. A second and equally important manufacturing process, which Hirose again has proven to be the industry leader in bringing to the market is insert mold technology. Previously and still used exclusively by some of our competitors is a manufacturing technique called press fitting. Starting with an already plastic injection molded piece, separate metal contacts are press fit to the plastic, essentially like dipping a paper clip, clipping a paper clip onto a piece of plastic. Combined to form a connector element, but leaving limitations on the maintain on the mechanical accuracy and mechanical stability. A second challenge is the plating of contacts which require gold or other conductor layers on the exposed sections and a resistive coating, usually nickel on the internal sections, which introduces yet another level of imprecision due to the small geometries involved. Hiroshi has led the industry starting in 2011 with the introduction of insert molding. In this case, the metal contact structures are actually placed within the plastic injection mold meticulously held in position as the mold is sealed and filled, resulting in a perfectly aligned and fixed metal landscape embedded in, within the rigid plastic itself, easily taking the precision from an order of magnitude of tenths of a millimeter to hundredths of a millimeter, both in terms of contact positioning and placing and plating area control, which in here is pre-delimited pre-delineated by the plastic borders. Since leading the way in bringing insert molding to the high volume manufacture of microconnectors, we've continued to refine and extend these capabilities, including a growing offering of micro board to boards, insert molded micro coax RF solutions, as well as applying insert molding to new classes of connectors, including zero insertion force solutions. Fully armored designs and insert molding bring inherent ruggedization and reliability, but connector design can also directly benefit the assembly process. And I'm gonna interrupt my own presentation because my PC is starting to die and I'm gonna grab my cable. So sorry for that, give me 30 seconds. Well, I'm glad you caught that, Mark, because uh, we would hate for you to die right in the middle of your presentation, so. I ask you all to hang in there for just a minute. I'm sure, um, sure Mark will be right back. Okay, here he comes. I'm back. I'm plugging in. I, this is better than having my PC die in the middle of the presentation. Okay, now I got power. Speaking of the needs for power in remote devices, right? 
So let me repeat that. Fully armored designs and insert molding bring inherent ruggedization and reliability, but connector design can also directly benefit the assembly process. One recent and pretty significant evolution in this is our own ZIF connectors in a new family of products called the One Action family. If you've ever worked with a ZIF cable assembly, you'll recall there's some sort of mechanical actuator, usually a bar like this, that after inserting the cable, you close manually. This actuator may flip up from the front or the back or may be lifted at the edge or the center, but it's always there and always a necessary part of the mating operation. Hiroshi introduced our own patented and industry unique One Action series in 2018, not too long ago. With the One Action solution, the FPC or FFC cable is simply inserted, period. And just to do that once more, and if needed, it's removed with a single manual lift at the back of the connector. The mechanism involves, spr uh, the mechanism involves spring loaded locking levers, which are lifted by the cable insertion itself, then automatically fall to close and lock on the inserted cable. This simple design evolution immediately brings multiple advantages from shipping and storing to design and component placement freedom to assembly efficiency. So what's the benefit in terms of shipping and storing connectors just by this redesign? Well, sort of surprisingly, typical ZIF connectors require the actuator to be shipped and stored in the open position. Closing the actuator without a cable inserted can immediately degrade the spring contacts. Since the one action series don't involve manual locking, this concern disappears and shipping and storing connectors is simplified with no damage concerns and connector trays, which can be more closely packed in transit and in storage. So what's the design benefit? In our one action, since no actuator access is required, design layouts may therefore encroach closely on the connector with result in small keep out areas in both the vertical and the rear depth directions. In a typical ZIF design, on the other hand, access to the actuator during product assembly must be accommodated, resulting in much larger footprint allocations in those same vertical and horizontal directions. And the assembly benefit is the most obvious. The simplified insertion process that we already showed offers significant efficiency advantages, saving steps, no closing of an actuator, and reducing cycle time in high volume manufacturing environments, whether manual or robotic assembly is employed. Hiroshi's One Action Series are available in horizontal and vertical orientations and offer excellent signaling abilities to handle a range of leading signal protocols. Okay, let's look at one more medical product type. In this case, a larger form factor consumer device, such as this tabletop ultrasound device shown here. And again, the issues we'll discuss could apply to other examples, such as larger handheld medical monitors, portable diagnostic equipment, or at-home smart medical device portals. Larger form factor devices are even more likely to have multiple components, subboards, and display, touch, sensor elements included making variability in pin counts and stack heights important, but in this case with a need for slightly larger dimensions. One family of solutions that's really worth sharing, which has a lot of options available, including stack height variations, is our DF40 series. The DF40 starts with an aggressive but manageable pitch of 0.4 millimeters and mated width or depth of less than three millimeters. The height comes in at 1.5 millimeters so again, we've moved up from the micro form factors of 0.6 or even 0.5 millimeters we discussed earlier. And in this case, with an option of multiple different receptacles offering mated heights and steps all the way up to four millimeters and all with a single common PCB mounted header. And within each of these separate height options, we've tooled a wide range of pinouts supporting from as few as 10 to as large as over 100 pin counts in each of these styles. 
Another slightly light, another slightly larger pitch option and slightly wider option is our DF12 family. It's also tooled with a single receptacle and multiple height mating pieces. This family extends the height options to 4.5 millimeters and is this particular choice is rated to full auto grade operation of 125 degrees C. Finally, an even slightly larger option is the DF-17, which extends the height all the way up to eight millimeters. Another concern that becomes more important in larger devices with free space inside is ensuring that internal connectors stay connected when in use. And here the key metric is retention force. Larger products, having a lot of free space isn't always a good thing. It invites damage and disconnects through aggressive drop or shock or repeated handling or positioning of the product. As a result, the connectors used may need additional features to prevent that from happening. We've addressed this concern with multiple solutions, starting with ZIF series. The FH35 places the actuator on the opposite side of the connector. Maybe not the perfect images, but let me explain what I mean. The flexing, once you've inserted your cable, almost uh, inevitably in a product, you're going to need to bend that cable to get to where it needs to go. Because of the position that we placed our, our, our unmating lever, flexing of that FPC cable is much less likely to touch and move or worst case, dislodge the actuator. So it's sort of opposing direction. So the motion that the cable normally bends is, if anything, going to push that locking lever even tighter, not do anything to, uh, to degrade the locking step or mechanism. We also included dual top and bottom gripping contacts for each of those metal leads on the cable itself with a strong cable retention force over 2x many alternative solutions. Another option is a vertical orientation solution, the TF38, which includes an actuator, which again releases opposite the typical direction of an inserted FPC's curvature. And again, avoiding inadvertent opening and further enhanced in this case by a tabbed FPC catch on either side of that FPC socket. We've included that same tab catch mechanism in some of our previously mentioned one action series adding an industry-leading retention force together with superior ease of use. So what about board-to-board -board options? For small or medium board-to-FPC solutions, that variable height, the DF12 I mentioned a couple slides ago, also includes ruggedized retention design features with our own internal testing of up to 100, 100 G acceleration in three dimensions. Our de facto industry standard solution, the U.FL, last year was enhanced with a new intermatable plug harness option, the U.FLA, which I mentioned previously as adding higher frequency support. Well, it also happens to add about 50% greater retention force compared to the original U.FL cable. And the DF40, and the same product family that I said is worth noting, also has multiple different options. One of those being an active locking option, noted by the L in the part number, if you're looking for it. In this case, the outer case has a separate metal structure that brings that, that is manually locked and brings the retention force up to over 20 Newtons, even for the lowest pin counts. And in some cases, retention force, often it's, it's, it's related to how many pins you have because each of those pins has a small spring that's trying to hold them in. So if you have 100 contacts, you're going to have much higher retention force overall than if you have a low pin count solution. Another design trend we're seeing more and more demand for is the need to handle increasing power or current levels, not only in the medium-sized consumer medical devices, but even for many of the smaller, such as wearable solutions that we discussed earlier. The need for increased power or current is due directly to more power hungry design elements, such as high resolution displays, cameras, or other subsystems, advanced wireless radios and supporting circuitry, and perhaps most obviously the battery lines themselves between the power supplies internal to the device and these systems. If we look at a sequence of series, this time from the right to left, 
Hiroshi again offers the very highest current ratings in these small form factors, from 3 amps to our very smallest solutions, up to 10 amps, for some still in the 0.6 millimeter height and 2 millimeter width ranges. These very high levels of integrated power are made possible by the novel inclusion of end metal structures, which double as mechanical reinforcement and dedicated power rails, combined with dedicated oversized solder pads. I can share today another new introduction, our just released BM50 series. The BM50 takes the focus on power to an even higher level, supporting up to 15 amps and still combining this capability with digital signaling support, all in an industry leading form factor of only 1.65 millimeters total width. BM50 comes in at only 0.6 millimeter stack height and is available with a four signal pins in addition to the power rails. Introduced concurrently with this is another similar option, the BK22, coming in slightly taller at 0.7 millimeters, but available with either four or six signaling pins. Shown on the left is the four, but it's also available with three top and bottom. So far, we've focused on internal connections but medical devices often include some external IO features as well. We'll look briefly at two new USB type C options, and then we'll introduce just as briefly a next generation LAN or RJ45 replacement option. USB type C is the latest, of course, de facto industry IO connection standard. Uh, we support many iterations of this at Arosa, including top mount versions, bottom mount, mid mount, as well as horizontal and vertical orientations of the connector itself. Today, I just want to share two very new introductions. First, a new water resistant IPX4 rated top mount option, which is quite suitable for medical devices, which may be wiped clean or used near water. At the same time, we've introduced an even more aggressive waterproof IPX8 mid mount design suitable for medical devices, which may be fully immersed. LAN connectivity is still a required feature in many medical devices. And finally, an updated option to the 40 year old RJ45 receptacle is now on the market with our own IX LAN connection standard, which we've introduced with a couple other industry partners. The IX brings a dramatic 75% volume reduction in size and increase in ruggedness and reliability. It's already gaining strong adoption in certain specific industrial segments, and it'll begin to emerge in a broader array of products in the coming years. And that ends the content section for today's webinar. We looked at a range of medical device examples, breaking it into very simple, smaller wearable style products and medium sized but still consumer facing medical devices. I hope you've gained a little insight into some of the design factors influencing device performance and how connector selection and specific connector metrics and features directly impact and in many cases improve the end results for these families of devices. We encourage you to follow up with any questions or requests you have. We have in-person sales offices across the country, most of those with technical staff in-house. And of course, our website's a great place to start where you'll find an easy to use product search button front and center. If you go to the application tab on that same page, you can find overviews with potential series to consider for different product classes. And next to it, the category tab is another simple path to explore our offerings by category, where you'll find connectors covered in this webinar, organized by type and characteristics. When you get to specific product pages, you'll often find 2D drawings and 3D simulation ready files available to directly download. And from our series pages, you can often find even more advanced touchstone file downloads, which are available like the other engineering files with a simple registration. Thanks for your time and interest, and there's a little preview of that connector sample kit. We'd love to get out to any or all of you who are interested. 
And I'll turn it back over to Bill, who will remind you of that. And I think we'll open it up for any questions, if there are any. Thank you, Bill. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Nice, uh, nice job. And uh, good thing you found that cable so quickly. Good job with that. <laughs> uh, we'd now like to open it up for questions. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it in the chat section of the website. And uh, give me a second here. Let's see if we have anything coming in. Uh, we've got one early one here. It's uh, let me read it to you, Mark. It says uh, Ziff connectors uh, aren't suitable for high frequency. Why would they be recommended? Well, maybe that's been true in the past. Today, actually, you know, we have some we have some of our highest frequency supports included in the Ziff family of products. Uh, the FH63S accommodates shielded FFCs, and that's specifically designed to allow higher frequency uh, into the several gigabit per second range. Uh, we have other series. Let's see the FH35, I know is one. FH34, which is a very popular series, those both support up to over 10 gigabits per second. So those, those are examples of ZIP solutions that are going to be able to drive, for instance, USB, you know, uh, the latest USB standards which is often the driving uh, you know, requirement behind a lot of our customers. So we think we have a pretty good, strong selection today. And it's true that in the past, maybe Ziff solutions haven't been so geared towards high frequency. But today, I think that's changing. And uh, so let us know if you have specific questions about uh, some frequency protocols that you'd like to support. And I think we can probably help you out. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I've got another question here. Um, the actively locked board to board connector you showed, is that done by hand or are tools required to open and close it? Uh, that's the DF40GL, just a reminder. And that's actually done by hand. So you don't need any special tools. It has, a, I, I can't, don't know if I can go back to that slide easily, sorry. But, but uh, if you remember, it did have a little metal tab sticking out from one of the ends and you actually can uh, pull or push on that to do the locking and unlocking mechanism. It is small, and if you have it sandwiched between two planar surfaces, it could be a little trickier to get in there and, and, and do that. So, you know, not saying that you might not want to end up using a, a tool to make that easier, but it's designed to be able to be uh, directly uh, manipulated by hand. All right, thank you. I've got, uh, oh, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, no, that's more of a comment. It's a positive comment, but a comment. Uh, and then we've got on the U.FLA, it says intermatable. Is that intermate? I think, I think someone was telling you there's a spelling error on that. So um, is it intermatable of our U.FL or intermatable with other brands? I'm sorry. That's. It's you. It's intermatable with our U.FL receptacle. So again, those those little RFs, you know, components I talked about. They consist of a small receptacle that you solder onto your PCB board, and then the cable assembly, which you click onto it with a little snap click. And the U.FLA is intermatable with our own U.FL receptacle. So it's really a way to take a a new or even existing design that has a Herosa U.FL receptacle and increase both the retention force by 50% and the signal integrity performance um, all the way up to uh, 18 gigahertz. So, so that's the answer is that it's intermatable with our own U.FL receptacle. Okay. Um, and just, just to clarify, it, it is not intermatable with another manufacturer's U.FL. Well, we certainly can't specify, we don't specify our parts be intermatable with our competitors part. But with that said, certainly the U.FL has been copied by many other suppliers. And so we're certainly not pretending that there aren't op aren't uh, possibilities to intermate uh, uh, connectors. Do we do testing with our competitors parts? No, we don't. So it's sort of up to you or maybe our competitor in that case to, to certify that it's going to work with the Herosa U.FL A uh, plug, but uh, there certainly are other suppliers that are have done copies of our U.FL receptacle. So you know whether those are intermatable with our U.FLA plug. Um, frankly, very likely they would be if they worked with our with our uh, with our with our previous uh, U.FL receptacle. But it's just something we can't officially you know uh, 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 endorse. Great, thanks for the clarification. 
Uh, and I've got one more question, might be the last one. Let's see. Uh, does the new IX standard connector mate with existing RJ45s? Oh, yeah, no, it does not. And it's a, that is sort of a chicken and egg problem, right? It's on such an entrenched standard, the RJ45. It is tough to bring something new to the market. It's going to take quite a while before this new standard can really take over mainstream device usage. I said it's already become a de facto standard. And those are in some sort of, you know, internally contained proprietary segments like industrial robotics is, or robots is one area where it's really taken off. Um, it is going to take quite a while. There are adapter cables that are available from ourselves and our partners in the industry who are introducing this standard. So you could certainly have a cable that has an RJ45 on one end and this IX on the other. Um, you know, I think maybe the interim is going to be just like you see on some laptops is having uh, maybe a transition period where you have the older connector socket, but you also have the newer one populated at the same time. So you're not Osborning the, the uh, interconnectability between you know devices. And that's something we'll sort of look forward to seeing if that starts to be the trend. But long answer, the answer is no, they're not intermatable, certainly not. Okay. It's a different form factor, but signaling is the same. Right, but there are um, there are dongles available, or you can uh, even yeah. have a you can even have a cable that's IX on one side and RJ forty five on the other. Is that right? Correct. Great. Okay. Uh, and then I've got two more questions, actually, from the same person on on the IX industrial. One of them is, um, what is the IP rating of the IX industrial? Oh, that's a good question. I think that there are some. You know, it's still early in the game. And they're just now starting, including ourselves, looking at some IPX rated versions of the of the of the cable. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer at hand as far as uh, a part number that I can refer you to, but I can give you a general response, which is yes, that's already being looked at. And if we get this gentleman's name and he's interested, we can certainly look and see where we're at on exactly introducing any of those IPX ratings for a uh, for a uh, for a uh, IX cable. Okay, yeah, and then he had a follow-up question, which was higher IP ratings coming soon? Question mark. And I think you just answered that. So yeah, if we yeah if we get his uh, info there, if one, okay. I think we can definitely give him some more specific feedback on that. Will do. Okay, and then I've got another one here. Uh, it's non uh, IX uh, related. Uh, have you looked at spring pins like pogo pins for long life connector contacts? What about thoughts for zero insertion force mechanisms? What was the last sentence? What about what for zero insertion force? What about the thoughts on zero insertion force mechanisms, which I think we do offer in our, our um, uh, you know, uh, many of our products. But go ahead. I'll let you, leave you. Yeah, to we've stuck to more of the traditional ZIF construction of, you know, spring-loaded metal contacts to mate to each of the, you know, uh, traces on the FPC themselves. And that seems to be working for us. The pogo pin style, uh, I, my understanding, my limited understanding of that is that might put us, throw us into a slightly or even significantly higher cost, you know, manufacturing uh, uh, arena, which, you know, for consumer products is, is not the direction a lot of our customers want us to go. So it may be that there certainly could be, you know, uh, technically superior designs that paths that we could pursue. You know, we've got to, if, it, if it's uh, to be a blunt, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Our customers aren't clamoring for, we haven't heard that uh, from any consensus of our, of our, you know, customers that we try to try to service over year after year. So, so we're doing the kinds of uh, things that are, we hear are important, like higher frequency support, like better DFM designs, like the one action is the great example of truly trying to address designed for manufacturing concerns from our higher volume customers. Um, even a lower insertion force is always desired. And that's something that we, you know, look at. And of course, a lot of those insert uh, ZIFs by definition have a very low insertion force, but still at the same time trying to uh, make sure they stay locked once they're put together. So no, we haven't looked at the pogo pin styles today, mm -hmm. but we're, we're always considering what's going to make the most sense for tomorrow. Okay, great. Um, and then there was another uh, a question in the Q&A section that talked about um, asking about waterproof versions of the IX standard. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, will there be any new uh, waterproof versions? 
Yeah, I don't know if there's a way to get out to everybody. If there's, that's a strong interest, we can definitely follow up. But we can definitely dig up, you know, the very latest uh, updates on where that stands from our perspective. And even some of our partners who are introducing these IX products, I think we'd be happy to share any information we can more generally yeah. since yeah, we're yeah. working with them to push this standard. But uh, if we have those names of the folks who are asking those, yeah, let me let me help dig up and we'll make sure to get them some more details. OK, um, yeah. I mean, you kind of answered that earlier in the IP rating questions, but I just um, yep, it was it was it was in the Q&A and I just wanted to make sure you got it. Um, and then I've got another one here in the Q&A questions of uh, do the sample kits include a test board for a, a test board and FPC? Yeah, they do. Now, are they are they able to be used for active testing? No, these are more for show and tell and field. Uh, you know, they're sort of stubs on the cable. So it'd be a little I don't think there's even exposed uh, traces to do anything with on the other end. Uh, you know, they're just literally cut with a pair of scissors or something like that. So these aren't ideal for testing. But what we do have are active test boards for most of these connectors. You know, some are available off the shelf. Some we may have to get Japan to ship us something. But if you start to zero in, you know, you as any any audience member start to zero in on products of interest and you uh, test board is often something that we know our customers need. Uh, just let us know. That's where you can contact us and we can help get you actual active test boards. None of these I'm looking at here are active test boards. These are all sort of dummy show and tell boards that uh, you can look to and get a feel for how the connectors look, how they feel, how they connect, you know, literally and disconnect. And uh, just let us know what you need after that. Test boards are definitely an option, but that's not what that's not what we're uh, showing here. These are just something for you to see the connectors, really. OK. Um, I think that might be about it where you've uh, we're kind of out of uh, questions. And um, so let me wrap it up by saying thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we hope the webinar has been informative and you've gained some ideas to help you with future consumer electronics hardware designs. Uh, and don't forget to follow Hiroshi on LinkedIn. Good day and stay safe. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.